Hello everyone, we're here at the Calabasas Library for Authors' Night. I'm your host, Karen Foley, and our guest today is Connie DeMarco, who also has written a series under Connie Archer. And we look forward to hearing about all of those books. You're quite a prolific writer. Have you always wanted to be a writer? Actually, no. I used to think it was the most horrible occupation to be stuck in. Um, why is that? What well, did, you have to make you things... What did you think of it? <laughs> I was uh, creatively bored and I've always been a mystery lover, always loved mysteries and thrillers. And I sort of worked up my courage and thought, I'm going to try to write a mystery. And I discovered that it was a lot harder than I even suspected. I knew it would be hard, but it was harder. And uh, it took me about three years, I think, for the first one. And I finished it. And I found an agent on the basis of that book, and she loved it as well. And uh, the economy was sort of going south in 2007, 2008, and she wasn't able to sell it. So I still believed in my project, so I thought, okay, I wrote a second book. And finally, I wrote a third book. And at that point, my agent called me and she said, would you be interested in doing a cozy series that's set in Vermont? Um, and it's set in a soup shop in Vermont. And I said, sure, why not? At this point, I sort of felt like an old hand. So I thought, okay, I will do that. So we submitted chapters, and uh, they, uh, at that time it was just Penguin, and since then they've merged. It's now Penguin Random House. And they offered me a three-book deal. And uh, so, of course, I was terrified because this would be my first published book. This was A Spoonful of Murder. And I sent it off to New York, and uh, they published it, and it became a national bestseller within a week. And I was nobody was more stunned than I. <laughs> well, trust me. I mean, that's quite instant <clears throat> fame. Yeah. Well, in, in the cozy world, and I never realized there was such a, a subgenre. What do you of, mean, cozy world? Well, mysteries are broken down into traditional mysteries cozy mysteries, which has kind of come to mean humorous, although not always. And cozy mysteries are basically village mysteries, like an Agatha Christie. Um, and there's often, many of these series have hooks. In my case, the hook is soup and soup recipes. So there's a subgenre of culinary cozies where the authors create recipes, and you can find the recipes in the backs of the books. And people love them. There's a huge market in this, which I had no idea because I've always been more of a reader of darker mysteries and thrillers. Now, what did you do before you wrote? Oh, all kinds of things. I worked as an actress for many years, um, mostly in television. And people say, oh, that's so exciting. It really, really wasn't. <laughs> um, I did mostly TV stuff like L.A. Law and um, ER and... Uh, um, I played one of the weird Fokker cousins on Meet the Fockers, but we were cut out of the theatrical release. So I always had a day job, but I did that. You know, when an opportunity arose, I would book a job and, and work as an actress, which is probably what led me into writing, because basically I think both professions are the same job. We're, we're both in the entertainment industry. Now, you said it was told to you that it's set in Vermont, having, well, I don't know if I can really say I spent a lot of time, I spent skiing weekends in Vermont. That's pretty good. But, you know, shopped around the local stores, and with your writing, I felt I was, well, back there again. The people oh, seemed you. quite authentic. Thank you. Have you ever lived or visited Vermont? Well, I grew up in New England. I, I was oh, born... Oh, really? Oh, then you... Yeah, yeah I'm not, I, I've been in California for many, many years, but I was born in Boston. I grew up there, and I went to school there, and my older daughter was born there. And at this point, my husband had a job offer in San Francisco, so that brought us out to the West Coast. But I've spent loads of time in all over New England because of that. And Vermont, um, you know, Vermont's a really, really special place. There's something very, it's a very bucolic place. Uh, we went for a visit a few years ago on a research trip uh, <laughs> slash vacation, and my husband couldn't believe it. We were on the, on the highway going from Burlington to Montpelier, and there were about three cars on the, on the freeway. If you can imagine that. The pleasure. Yeah. And there's quaint villages, barns. Very insular. 
you know, they're kind I, of within themselves. Yeah, I think New they're England. They're one community in New England. Yeah, I was just at um, Malice Domestic, which is a huge mystery convention. It's held every year in Bethesda. And I served on a panel called Murder in New England. So our subject was why New England and why are people attracted to mysteries set in New England. Um, New England's kind of a creepy place. You know, there's a lot of woods. <clears throat> there's been a lot of wars. There's been the French and Indian Wars, the King Philip's Wars, the Indian massacres that occurred in colonial days that uh, forced everyone to kind of come back to Massachusetts and settle around Salem. So there's an incredible history in New England, but it is sort of tucked away in the northeast corner of the country, and a lot of people don't get to visit there and don't know much about it. They're missing a beautiful part of the country. Yeah. So you've always been attracted to mystery, so that was kind of right up your alley, so yeah. to speak. And what about cooking? In particular, are you a soup creator, a soup maker? I do love to make soups. I really do. The funny thing is that when I turned in my first manuscript, I was a complete babe in the woods when it came to publishing and the business, and I did not know that I was supposed to give them the recipes. So about a week after I turned in my first manuscript, I got an email from my editor in New York, and she said, um, are you going to send us some recipes? And I thought, oh my god, I have to do that. So I scrambled around and, and, and sent her some of my favorite recipes and a few new ones. The hardest part about submitting recipes is that when, when I cook, I just throw things in the pot, as most of us do, and I never thought about amounts or ingredients or anything, so I had to start from scratch and recreate the soup and write everything down. That was the hardest part of the recipe. Well, I think we should tell the listeners that it's kind of like a Nora Ephron book. You read the plot and you get hungry. Right, right. And then my publisher came out with the Cozy Cookbook, uh, which is excerpts from various culinary cozy authors that concern the characters talking about the food they're making and then the recipe. So, um, yeah, the Cozy Cookbook is a great so how many of these books are in the Soup Lover series? There's five so far. The fifth one, this Clue in the Stew, just came out last month. And uh, it's, it was first published in, um, I think, A Spoonful of Murder came out in August 2012. So it's only been a few years, four years. How, how many books do you write per year, do you think? Well, my contract with these was very tight. Uh, I only had eight months. To and write a full book? Oh, yeah. Did, did they edit it, or do you have to get your own editor? Oh, no, they do everything. They want to see everything. Um, it, you know, Penguin and Random House merged back in 2013, and so they, are, uh, very, they want to see what's being submitted. They want their editors to do the, the structure editing, and then they want their editors to do the copy editing, and they're excellent at that. Um, so I didn't have to worry about that. I had two months to submit an outline, one of my, two of my editors over the last several years want the outline first, and that doesn't take two months. So then I have another six months to complete the manuscript and get it in. And fear is a great motivator once you've signed a contract. So <laughs> <laughs> believe me, my deadlines were in red pen in my calendar, I, I knew. But I would try to finish each book two months before it was due that would give me um, a chance to send it out to four or five trusted people, friends and readers, um, that would uh, be discreet, keep the plot to themselves, and give me their feedback and tell me where they thought it needed more explanation or uh, the things that they liked or the things that confused them. Because when you're writing a book, you're so much into it that you're not seeing the whole forest, and sometimes you'll leave out salient, important items that will confuse a reader. So I would send it out to my reading group uh, two months before, and then I'd spend the last two months going over it many more times myself. So daily, you must have to write daily. Daily, yeah, and weekends and nights and whatever time. Holidays, 24-7. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't stop. So <laughs> I used to have a life. <laughs> But this is, qu look at the organizations you belong to. I was very impressed with it, let me see. Well, sisters, International Thriller Writers, mm -hmm. Mystery Writers of America, Sisters in Crime. Mm -hmm. How Does that take up a lot of your time? 
Um, not really. I served on the, bo lo the local board of Sisters in Crime uh, for about a year as membership director. And that was kind of like a part-time job on top of everything else. Uh, they lost their membership director, so I took over. Um, international thriller writers, all these organizations offer wonderful benefits to writers. They have websites where you can put your books online on their websites. International thriller writers and mystery writers and thriller writers are just the most wonderful people in the world. They're so friendly and they're so welcoming. And I really wanted to join international thriller writers because I'm more of a thriller reader. And uh, the year that Spoonful came out, the following year they offer a debut authors program. And so they welcome you to New York. Um, we were all welcome to a wonderful breakfast, special sessions. Um, even though I wasn't writing thrillers, I sort of felt like, wow, they, they let me join the club. So that was great. How do you anticipate keeping up? Are you going to keep up with that one series, or are you just going quickly into another one? Well, at this point, Penguin and Random House have merged, so oh. they haven't made decisions as yet as to which series they want to continue. So if they want to continue this series, I think two more in this series would be wonderful if I could finish all the loose threads and move my characters along so their, their lives are in a good place. Um, but if they don't, then a Clue in the Stew does that, I think, pretty well. Do you like to keep the same characters in the books? Or well, move on? yeah. In traditional mysteries, you tend to keep the core group of characters. And each book, I've uh, tried to bring one particular character to center stage with each book. So usually, you know, it's a village mystery. And there's only about 953 souls in the village when the series starts. But I had to. I found that I had to keep a cent, a death record census because, <laughs> as the bodies were discovered, the the population diminished. But then new people would come to the village and stay. So um, I found that uh, the village had a very high murder rate. But most of the evil and the crimes come from outside, but usually involve one or more of the core characters in the village. But you also write cookbooks. Well, is that a separate series or just isolated? No, again? Um, I don't really write cookbooks. Um, the Cozy Cookbook was an invention of my publisher, oh, Penguin okay. Random House. And they gathered together all the culinary cozy authors and their excerpts and recipes, and they did that book. And I'm in there with many other people. And then the Mystery Writers of America wanted to also do a cookbook. And I, I you know, when I first got the email, I wrote back and said, oh, please, I would love to be in the Mystery Writers of America cookbook. I'm doing this soup series. And they said, sure, submit a recipe. So my um, uh, chicken artichoke tarragon soup is in that cookbook, uh, which is very popular. And it's a gorgeous cookbook, uh, amazing illustrations. And um, I'm not on the next page, but I'm in the same book with Sue Grafton and her peanut butter and pickle sandwich. Peanut butter and pickle? <laughs> Which is in all her books. Her character makes peanut butter and pickle sandwiches. And Lee Child, among many, many other thriller writers, is in that book. And he has a recipe for coffee pot of one, because his character drinks coffee in all the Jack Reacher novels. So that was kind of a thrill to be in that book. I'd like to know a little bit about how your family deals with your time oh, constraints that you Well, have. my daughters are grown. Um, and they have their own lives and their own interests. My husband uh, o only reads history and will not read fiction. He only reads nonfiction. Um, but he's very good about watching foreign crime dramas with me. So we watch uh, all the shows that are on the International Mystery Channel. Is there an International Mystery Channel? Well, KCET locally aired the um, MHZ.org, it was called, International Mysteries, and they had uh, the Inspector Montalbano, which is based on Andrea Camilleri's books. They had Swedish productions of the old Beck books from the 70s, which were wonderful. And um, what else did they have? Uh, a couple of Swedish series, different Wallanders, as well as the British Wallander. Because um, I'm just relegated to looking through TCM and an occasional PBS. 
Well, PBS is now airing Vera and Shetland, which I'm in love with. I'm totally in love with those series. As, and Grantchester and Father Brown. There's some wonderful stuff. Sundance used to have a lot of them, but not <clears throat> yeah. so much. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll take our quick break. Okay. And if you don't mind, we'll go on to the next series as okay. Connie DeMarco. Thank you, Karen. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I hear he travels from the north. Look! That one's really dry. L.A. is in a drought. Yet over half of our drinking water is being used for landscaping. But it doesn't have to be that way. Just one inch of rain can yield thousands of gallons of water for use in landscaping and saves drinking water for drinking. Rain barrels, cisterns, and curb cuts are just a few ways to save water and energy. For more, visit LADWP and the Bay Foundation online. Back at the Calabasas Library here at Authors Night with Connie DeMarco and her new series, The Zodiac Mysteries. And these take place in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So now I know why it's New England and then San Francisco. You've oh. lived in both places. Right, right. Been, do you go back to San Francisco often? Yes, I try to get up there at least once a year. Um, and I'm always on a picture taking mission. Uh, this is one of my oh, photos. It's one of your Pictures. And um, I just, I love it there. You know, I don't live there anymore. I, this is my home now for a lot of years, but I still miss it. It's a city with so much atmosphere, and I always felt that it was a great place to set a mystery series. There's secret stairways. Shrouded there's in fog. Shrouded in <laughs> fog. There's hidden alleyways. Yes. There's cobblestones here and there. Cobblestones, right. Chinatown. There's just mysterious places there. So. And Alcatraz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the first in your series, which I had the pleasure of also reading, is Madness of Mercury. Mm -hmm. The protagonist is an astrologer. What gave you that inspiration for astrology? In I was series? I was thinking of what kind of a character I would want in San Francisco. I knew I wanted to set something in San Francisco because it's a wonderful city to write about. Plus, it's a city I know very well. Um, and San Francisco has changed over the years since I lived there, but it always had a very strong counterculture and occult world there. There were many, many practitioners of the occult. And I thought, why not an astrologer? And it just seemed to fit. And Do you go to an astrologist? Um, no, I actually have a program on my computer that I can use myself, so I don't need to. <laughs> Do you look to the stars and to the sky for it's guidance? Yeah, it's, astrology is wonderful for timing, particularly timing of events. And usually life happens, and you'll, I'll go back and look at my chart and go, oh, wow, that's what, that's what was going on then when that happened. I certainly don't check it every day. Um, I know when I have a Saturn transit coming up, and I think, hmm, how will that manifest? And I make sure I look at my husband's and my daughter's charts. And one of my daughters will, uh, once a year, we do an astrological session. And she'll want to know what's going on with her chart for that year. So, and you friends. Do, you friends. don't read for other people? No. I have in the past uh, as a way of learning, but no, I, I don't practice. I used to read the tarot for other people. Ah, yeah. I love the tarot. There's actually a, a tarot mystery series from Midnight Inc. as well. Really? Yeah, and unfortunately, I, it's written by a man and a woman, and unfortunately, I don't remember their names, but they have a, a series of tarot. People do scoff at some things like this, but it's they don't once they have a reading. Right. I think so, too. After and actually, they're I, quite quiet. <laughs> there was just a review, I think, on... Um, 
the publisher sent it out to various readers with a net galley link and one man wrote a review and he loved the book and he gave it five stars and he said as soon as I realized it was about astrology I thought oh, I don't want to read it and then he read it and he loved the book and he said actually the astrology sprinkled throughout but it's basically a mystery. Do you find that astrology is genetic? Huh. I don't. The oh, you occult? mean in terms of fa looking at family yes. charts? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The the people that we spend our lives with, the people that are important in our lives, there's always ties between charts. It's amazing. I'm a Sagittarian with my Moon in Leo. My older daughter is has the exact same configuration, and my younger daughter is a Leo with a Moon in Scorpio. But when you line up family charts between children and parents and grandparents even, there's amazing ties. You know, you'll find children that don't get along very well with their parents, but they get along very, very well with their grandparents. So it's fascinating to look at. People don't really like to know about that, except if you stand people together or in a party or in a room. Uh huh. And... If they're relatives, you can say how many people have had this experience, how mm -hmm. many people can recognize this, how many people can read your signs. Mm -hmm. I find it absolutely amazing. And yeah. my husband, you know, big disbeliever in everything. Mm -hmm. We were at a social gathering once, and he sort of challenged my sisters, well, read everybody's sign. She got 99% of them. That's Only one great. said no, and I'll bet that they did it just to be a, a contrarian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I find it amazing. Yeah. But what started you with an interest in the occult? Well, I remember one one memory that has that surfaced years later was I remember being a little kid watching television and it was I believe a special on India. And I was probably seven, eight, nine years old, somewhere in that range, and they flashed an astrological chart on the screen mentioning in passing Indian astrology. It wasn't about astrology. I think it had to do more with India. And I looked at that and I thought, whoa, what is that? I was fascinated. What are all these arcane symbols? You know, I felt like I was kind of getting a little key to the universe. And of course, it, you know, I'm old enough that in those days there weren't a, a lot of occult bookstores as there were later. And um, <clears throat> I was uh, in college and my mother died very suddenly. Uh, with no warning. And there were various other things that happened. My boyfriend at the time was hit by a car. There was a danger that he might lose his leg. My dad was totally devastated by my mother's death, as we all were. And um, it was a terrible year. It was a very, very rough winter in Boston, <laughs> of course. And at the time, a girlfriend of mine called me, and we were going to the same college, and she said, I went to a party in Cambridge, and I met a woman who's an amateur astrologer, and she's looking for people to practice on, and I want you to come with me. And I said, I don't really feel up to it. I've got too much to do and too much going on. And she said, no, 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 I'm dragging you. You're coming with me. So we went to visit this woman who had a little apartment in Cambridge. She was a little older than we were at the time. And she set up our charts, and she said to me, oh, my word, you're going through a really terrible time. And, of course, I burst into tears on her kitchen table. I said, yes, it has been very, very hard. And she said, but really by May, everything in your life will change. Everything will change, and all of this will go away, which is one of the most valuable things about astrology is to understand that these things pass, and there is a timing to it, and you can actually yes. figure it out. And she was correct. And at the time, I had no idea. But at that point, I started to buy astrology books and study and practice on people as she was doing. And of course, now I sort of know what she was seeing in my chart at the time. But at the time, it felt like magic. Um, so I just, over the years, I just continued to read. And I found absolutely fabulous authors like Noel Teal and Liz Green, who's a Jungian analyst and a scholar, and she writes fabulous books, and Stephen Arroyo. There's many, many brilliant authors that have surfaced since those years. Um, so, yes, I'm a big devotee of astrologers. <laughs> Everything has an explanation, and like you say, there's nothing really unexplainable. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Well, but if some... it's unexplainable. <laughs> 
for purpose. It has a purpose. It may not yeah. be able to be explained, mm -hmm. but it has a purpose in one's life. Well, one theory, uh, and it's a Robert Hand theory, who's another wonderful writer, is that your needle chart is a blueprint of your life's path, and it describes your intentions at birth, which I think is, is a wonderful way to put it. And he also says that the, it isn't that the planets cause things to happen to you, it's that they are a um, um, macrocosm that mirrors back the inner microcosm of where you're going and what you're doing and what sort of a character you have and what choices you will make given certain circumstances, which I think is a good way to put it. What do you have planned for the Zodiac Mysteries? You have the first one. The first one is The Madness of Mercury. Are you going to name them all after planets? I hope so. I hope my publisher will agree. I think they will because they're, um, they publish wonderful books and they're very open to um, things that are offbeat. Um, but the first one is The Madness of Mercury, which um, the Mercury myth, uh, Mercury wasn't just a messenger of the gods. He was a trickster and he was a liar. And we, we have the phrase silver-tongued. Yes. Okay, which is Mercury. Um, and this book, the, the first one, The Madness of Mercury, involves a power-hungry preacher who comes to the city and develops a huge cult following. And it's very loosely based on the Jim Jones years in San Francisco when I was living there. And this preacher uh, has followers called the Army of the Prophet. Julia, my protagonist, has a newspaper column, an advice column called Ask Zodia, and people write to her. And a woman writes to her because she's concerned that her mother has joined a church, but the church has required her to sign over all her property and her life savings. And Julia is a rather opinionated character, as I am at times. Well, I enjoy <laughs> her also. And Julia speaks out very vehemently against yeah. this church and advises the woman to have it investigated and to hire a lawyer. Because and this, gets in a lot of trouble. Right, right. And she becomes a target of, of the preacher and his followers. And that is just the backdrop of the actual mystery, which the potential murders happen a lot closer to home. So, and you've read it, so you know. So, <laughs> and you've been very fortunate in having your books published by a yes. known publishing house. Oh yes, very. have you always had this? Been lucky enough to have your books published traditionally. I have. Um, I didn't know anything about the business when I started out. Um, I did want to be traditionally published. I want to, wanted to know what that experience was like. Um, Things have changed so much in the last 10 years, and the stigma of self-publishing has really gone away. And there are, most authors are hybrid authors. They're traditionally published and self-published because they may have a following because they write romance, um, but their publisher doesn't want to publish their horror books, for example. So they'll write under another name and perhaps self-publish if no one wants to pick it up. Are you going to keep your two last names? Yeah. yeah, I think so. The second book in the Zodiac Mysteries is tentatively entitled Dark Sun. And that's less of a dystopian uh, thriller, but it is a mystery. Um, I don't really um, have a blurb prepared for that in my head, but it concerns a family and a wonderful husband who commits the ultimate faux pas by shooting his sister-in-law but did he really shoot her? And that is Dark Sun, which I have just submitted to my publisher, and that will be out next year. So I'm very excited. Let's just take a quick break, then we'll come back for a few more questions on how to reach Connie and how to get her books. Please stay with us for Authors' Night. Again? Hey, Dad. Dad. There are other ways of saving money and energy around your house. Did you know that LADWP is now offering cash rebates for you to retrofit your home to be more energy and water efficient? It's good for California, and it's good for Dad. 
Let's make California a better place to live, starting with our homes. To get your rebates, go to www.ladwp.com slash save. Not it. Not it. We're back to Authors' Night here at the Calabasas Library with Connie DeMarco, very prolific author, which brings me to today's world where everybody likes to give you their opinion on your work, whether you ask for it or not. And right? With a blog, or do you have a blog? Yes, on my website. Blogs and with the social network and email, do you get a lot of critiques from your readership? Um, not critique so much. I do hear from a lot of readers, a lot of times, mostly on Facebook. When I wrote the third book in the Soup Lovers Mysteries, my protagonist has a romantic relationship that's building. And I didn't want the series to get boring. And so when I wrote the third book, I thought it's about time for them to have some trouble in the relationship, as all relationships do. There's a, an event that happens that makes her very jealous. And as it turns out, it's funny how themes evolve on their own. A Rue of Revenge is the third book in the series, and in that series, a group of Scottish Gaelic-speaking travelers comes into Vermont. They're based in Nova Scotia, and as it turns out, one of them has a secret past with one of the villagers. And really the theme of the whole thing ended up being about relationships and about faded lovers and about love lost or chances not taken. And so when I end, got to the end of Rue of Revenge, I realized I needed to tie up this, this battle that was going on between my protagonist and her love interest. And I thought, okay, probably a re the readership will want all the ends neatly tied up. We'll want to see them get back together again. But it didn't feel right. And then it didn't also feel right to have them break up. Neither choice seemed correct. So I mulled it over and I finally ended it on a cliffhanger where she has told him she's not ready to make a commitment. She's too frightened. He has explained his mistakes. He's tried to mend their bridges. And she essentially pushes him away. And then in the final scene, I had her go through an epiphany and wait on his front steps for him to return. And the final scene is he pulls into the driveway and the headlights rake across the lawn and she stands up waiting for him. And there's no final answer. And boy, did I hear about that. Oh, People my. like it all sewed up. Yeah, they like it all sewed up. They don't like any cliffhangers. They don't like any questions. They don't like... But life isn't like that. Life isn't like that, exactly. So. I sent it to my editor, and I explained my reasoning, and I said, if you hate it, I'll change it. I'll make it one or the other. Um, probably they'll get back together again. And, and my editor said, no. She said, I love the cliffhanger. Just leave it. I had a wonderful editor. Once the book came out, I got so many upset Facebook messages and emails. It's like, how could you do this to us? We want to know what happens, what happens. Well, I said, you have to read the next book. So <laughs> so you get back to everybody who... Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I yeah. always do. I, I love to hear from readers, and, and I haven't heard anything negative. Um, the first Facebook message I ever received was from a woman who said she loved A Spoonful of Murder. This is the soup series. But when she got to the end, she was devastated because there wasn't a recipe for chicken artichoke tarragon soup. So I had to send her the recipe. And I wrote a blog about it called The Neglected Artichoke. So <laughs> she was happy. I would like for you to read a, a, a paragraph or mm -hmm. a scene in one of your books uh -huh. so people can understand the type of writer that you are. Okay, sure. Uh, Julia has her newspaper advice column, Ask Zodia, as I mentioned. So she's at home this evening. Uh, she's going through her emails and she's trying to answer some questions for writers who have written into the Chronicle. I opened a few more emails and moved a bunch into a folder to consider later, ones that I felt were not terribly interesting. I set aside to be returned to Sam for her form letter, referring the writers to other astrologers. I worked through several more questions and responses and then saved them all. 
This was hardly a perfect way to practice astrology, but hopefully my quick judgments and answers would be spot on and help someone head in the right direction. I clicked back to my inbox and realized three more emails had arrived while I had been working. I didn't recognize the various senders. The Ask Zodia address had been set up only for Samantha, but these new emails weren't from her. My private clients and friends wouldn't even know of this address. I hesitated. I'm a hopeless non-techie person and I rely on my computer for business, so I'm very fearful of viruses. I clicked on the button to open the reading pane and scrolled down. A jolt of fear shot through me. The message read, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Perfect ending to a perfect interview. I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. A talented, I'm lovely so lady, Connie DeMarco. Thank you, our media operations department. Thank you, City of Calabasas and our library. Since you write two series, I'm going to end with two quotes okay. from astrology subject matter. One is from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, Men should take their knowledge from the sun, the moon, and the stars. And on a very pragmatic financial matter, John Pierpont Morgan says, Anyone can be a millionaire, but to become a billionaire, you need an astrologer. <laughs> and thank you so much, thank Connie you, DeMarco. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, audience.